So you'd like us to introduce ourselves? I would. Okay. Okay. Can, uh, is everyone uh, hearing? Okay. At this tone of voice, you can. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, my name's Len Kaufman. I've been a farmer all my life in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania. I'm actually a 10th generation farmer um, on the same basic property. But um, so I have been involved in uh, forage and, and farming uh, all of my life. Uh, I, I, did, I did work with Penn State University in, for a few years, um, well, 25 years with uh, d doing research and teaching and extension. And so I've had an opportunity to work with forages and with animals. And so one of my interests since uh, leaving Penn State and continuing to farm my farm, my interest has been on, on uh, unique and novel forages. And so um, this is what today's talk will be about some of the uh, experiences I've had with forages that are not common and typical, at least not in Pennsylvania. But I'd first like to introduce my partner, Dr. Judith Shoemaker. She's a veterinary and she's uh, licensed in 11 states and she does some really unique treatments to animals and uh, she will be speaking tomorrow afternoon uh, and, and talking about some of the animals that she works with and some of the animals that we have on our farm and, and that kind of thing. So my type of presentation is that I like to have discussion. And so I'm, uh, I, have left. I am not, um, I'm, I'm not opposed to just shouting out questions when they come along, when, when, when you see something that looks interesting or you have questions about. And if we don't finish the slides, so what, we'll at least deal with the questions. And so uh, uh, I'm going to speak about some of the uh, novel things that you may or may not have uh, worked with in forages. And, and, and one of the reasons that I've become interested in forages is that we're depending on a very few number of plants. We're depending on so few a group of plants that if we have a, uh, a serious problem with a species of forage, we don't have other things to fall back on because we are not trying them. We are not experimenting with them. And so if, if I want to uh, summarize my talk, it would be try something, even in a small way, try something that's new or different or unique and see how it works on your place because it, it all depends on your own situation, your own la land, your own climate, your own soils uh, to see what really works out. But I'm going to talk about my experience with some of these things. And uh, we'll start there with Cora Clover. Cora Clover. Make one, one reason why we had to do this is we raise Angora goats. And our Angora goats grow an inch of hair a month. They require at least 20 plus 26 percent protein ongoing throughout the whole year to do this. We're required by our AWA, our Animal Welfare Approved Program, to have them on the majority of their diet has to be forage. So we are, we're really needing to come up with some pretty fancy products here, you know, forages to be able to do this. So, and, and in addition to that, angora goats love to die of parasites. That's my bailiwick. <laughs> and so there we have, we have to have something that helps that as well. So um, here's a picture of some that we're not going to talk about because these are pretty much typical forages and that's some of the grasses, timothy and orchard grass and, and then in the middle, in the center there's alfalfa and, and in the corner there's bird's foot trefoil and in the, under the cor corner the yellow flowers is black medic but we all know about those. And so I'm going to focus on some of these unusual things and uh, there's, there's many reasons as I mentioned you know, just to have something that uh, if we have a problem, we, we can fall back on it. But there's advantages to diversity, too. And that is that, uh, you know, we can expect greater yields with some diversity. We can expect some greater soil health with diversity. And uh, uh, just a lot of things that can, that can come about 
and even you know to think about different forages maturing differently and I think as I uh, get through talking about some of these novel forages you uh, I'll mention that these mature earlier or these mature later and that way uh, we have uh, a little easier management of uh, uh, prescribed grazing and, uh, and intensive grazing. So we'll start with Cora Clover. Now has that, anyone tried Cora Clover? Okay. And uh, when I say something wrong, you just, tell, you just shout it out and say, you know, he's lying here. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I established this about uh, 11 years ago. And uh, it's still, it's still very persistent. It, it is still, uh, you know, producing a lot of forage. Now, there has been difficulty in recent years in getting seed, but now the seed is available. And I can, uh, if you want to talk to me later, I can tell you how to look up a source of Cora Clover seed. And the seed's expensive, but having something that is this persistent and this high yielding, that this is, this is yielding everything as much as red clover and more, but it's persistent. And we've heard from other talks that clover doesn't persist. Uh, core clover is one that persists. And it's very dense and it grows this tall and the goats are crazy about it. And it's been really, really a great thing to put into pastures that have a lot of um, weed in it because it, as you heard in the last talk, Pretty good about suppressing other other stuff. Well, yes, sir. I, yes. Is it considered an annual or perennial? It's perennial. Very I've perennial. I've established it 11 years ago, and it's still there. And it's spreading. And it's competing with bird, with uh, reed canary grass. And here's a photo of it competing with reed canary grass. So you know if something can compete with reed canary grass, it's got some persistence. Glenn, what, can you interstate that into an existing stand? Well. Uh, you know, I, I've, uh, I've had a, a long and good relationship with Marvin Hall at Penn State, and when I talked to him about Cora Clover, and I told him that I frost seeded it, he said, well, boy, you've been lucky. He said, he's been trying to seed it, you know, with regular drill, and has had mixed results. But mine was seeded with uh, frost seeding. Uh, in... in, bur in um, in reed canary grass. What rate uh, five pound the acre. And it has spread probably in that 10 years, it's probably almost doubled the, the square footage that it started in. I mean, it's going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, we have a novel forage here that there was a lot of work done to Penn State uh, years ago uh, as, uh, as forage chicory. And if my grandfather knew that I planted chicory on the farm, he'd be rolling over in his grave because that was, that was the thing. He, he went everywhere and pulled it out. He didn't want to have any of that on the farm. But uh, it, it, it has a place because it is so digestible. Um, and uh, similar to some of the brassicas, it has that, that uh, high, high and dense nutrition. Uh, however, in my experience is, it is not persistent. I'm finally summing out with the case. Now, what, and some of it reverted back to the old roadside. What looks like to me it reverted back to the roadside. Type. To the old roadside type of chicory, yeah. I planted it on my farm because I have a lot of compaction. My farm was a horse farm pre previous to this. Mm -hmm. And it did a really nice job for as long as it could persist. It did a really nice job in the sacrifice pasture. Um, the biggest problem I had is that as soon as I put the goats on it, they devoured it. They selectively ate it. So it's, it, it goes under pressure from the animals rather rapidly. But it did its job. It, it has a very, very deep taproot. And, uh, you know, if they don't eat it down to a nub, it'll, it'll do its work. And it would be great for finishing lambs with, you know, the high nutrition, the density of, of energy and, and minerals and vitamins for... Uh, How many years would you, would you add? Uh, 
The first year it's sparse, second year it's great, third year it's beginning to peter out, and fourth year you pretty well have, better have something else growing there. And so here's, uh, uh, here's a picture with some that's been there for three, four years, and so you see the white clover is, uh, is, more, is filling in where the, the chicory is fading out. But there's still some of it there. But I think it's kind of a neat picture because here we have red clover and we have chicory and we have white clover. And uh, I should explain that there's, I can tell the difference between red clover and outside clover and, and core clover because core clover has a different watermark on the leaves and the leaves are larger. Uh, but, and cora clover is persistent, red clover is not persistent. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Ceresia lespedeza. Now I know some of you from the Midwest are recognized this as, a, as an invasive weed. And it was, it was introduced in the United States, I, I, I think it comes from the Middle East, and, or, 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 or uh, Asia. Asia, and, um, and so some of you are going to say, uh, no, 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 but uh, it has a place. It ha and, and so my, uh, my work recently is I have been funded to do a research project to uh, experiment with uh, a new developed improved variety of Ceresia lespedeza that was developed by Auburn University. And if you uh, type Ceresia lespedeza into the internet, you'll get nice, um, a, a very nice video, a YouTube video of some of the work they've been doing in the southern states with parasite control. And my research is uh, related to <coughs> whether it really does control parasites and whether uh, it will survive this far north as in as Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, this the research that has been done with parasite control is done in the southern states. And, and they ha there's, there's good university research that's showing that it is con not only controlling the uh, hamacus, one of the worst in internal parasites of all animals, but it's also controlling coccidia. And so if any of you know, you know, if you have young animals, lambs, goats, calves, coccidia is something that we worry about. So we're feeding, or, uh, you know, what, what do we do for coccidia? We try to feed some of the ionophores uh, as, a, as the first feed, as the first feed that they eat. But uh, maybe now, and I, I think the other part of this that's, that's important is we don't have any warmers that work anymore. The warmers that we have now are the same ones we had 30 years ago. And none of the pharmaceutical companies are doing anything about researching for new, uh, new warmers, new anthelmetics. How many of you are sheep or goat producers? Ah, all right. So yeah, you know, we've got a serious problem. And, we, and it's always really upsetting to have to do what the southeastern parasite guys say, which is, oh, yes, you just have to call and, you know, let the, let the ones that don't have resilience or resistance die. Well, that, you know, I'm a veterinarian. That's really hard to do. So we need to come up with better ways to control. And I think that this will also select for our resilient and resistant animals because one of our biggest problems, you may be raising resilient or resistant animals, but if you have an overload on your pasture, you can kill a resilient or resistant animal very easily with a completely overwhelmed pasture. Now, obviously, um, rotation is, is a key part of this, but this is a really remarkable thing for that because it grows back really fast. It's a tough, really heavy forage, and it grows back in three weeks. So if you have a tough rotation schedule, if you can't go four, six, weeks in between rotations, this can really, really go. And it's amazing because it looks almost like a twig. It's that tough and it's that dense. But it really does. You question. Is there a pelletized version? Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, it is something I'm actually feeding on my farm. I'm feeding pellet uh, lespedeza. We have other clients who do as well, and it is working, but you have to get up to sometimes 20% of their caloric ration in that to make it actually work. And it costs a buck 40 a pound. So are you wanting to feed that much to a goat? It's a little, it's a little tight. But if we can start growing it and we can start haying it, that can make a big difference. It has an upright and a prostate type that can be hayed. And, and with this research project, the first year is primarily getting it established. So I established 12 acres of uh, AU grazer. Uh, and half of that will be hay and half of that will be grazing. And we'll, con uh, we will continue the research for four years uh, and, and try to, try to uh, get good enough research that it can be published. So uh, maybe there's a market for us crop growers to raise this hay and, and market the hay as something to help people that are having um, trouble with uh, parasites. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make I'm going to make hay on it uh, this coming year. This, this was the establishment year, but in in lieu of the thoughts that it might not work this far north, or I should say Pennsylvania north, is that I have common lespedeza that I've had now for 10 years, and it's it's surviving the winters on really bad soil. It's and, surviving uh, the winters quite nicely. No, all, all of them have the parasite controlling ability. The AU grazer is just an improved variety that is, uh, I mean, because if you get too high tannins, which is what makes it do its job, they won't eat it. So this is a, a variety that combines all these nice characteristics and the fact that this is a much more upright variety so that it can be hayed. Many of them are prostrate, and so they just run along the ground and the animals will eat them, and they do a lovely job on, you know, protecting the soil, but they're tough to hay. Yep. Yep. Now, uh, we, in our research, we have a collaborator that is a parasitologist. Uh, she's retired from uh, Virginia Tech, and she said that the AU grazer uh, is more effective than the common lespedeza at, uh, at taking care of the parasites. And I guess she's basing that on some of the research that was done in the southern states. Um, so, um, I, yes? We actually have a couple of producers uh, doing hay here in South Carolina, and uh, one of them, he has been on the hay business for a series of, since 2016, I believe. Oh. So, um, wow, that's yeah. great. And he's just uh, Uh, making yeah. small square bale hay yes. or making pellets? Uh, making small square bale Yeah, yeah. And we use uh, AU grazer. Right. AU grazer, yeah. I'm just curious on the hay, can you guys cut it before it's seed? Or if you're worried about spreading it, or do you have to kind of have it at animal? Well, your, your question has to do with, with invasiveness. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, so, uh, we need to talk to somebody in the Midwest about how invasive it is because I'm just getting it started. And so uh, my 10-year-old stand has not been incredibly invasive. It's moved about maybe 20 feet outside of and, uh, the pasture and a few sprigs here and there. That's it. And with that, do you guys think you could, with your goals, take it back if you said, oh, crap, and you opened up the can of worms? Do you think you could take it back, reverse it? Oh, we've suppressed the pasture next to it, yes. Yeah. It goes away. They learn to eat it, and then they love it. They like it a lot. Okay, so my 10-year-old stand, uh, they, they eat it very well. They, the goats eat it very well. Um, so we have to see now how we do with AU Grazer. So here's a picture of this year's seeding. Uh, spring seeding, uh, no-till seeding, uh, and this is what it did the first year. So, um, was that, you say you no-till, was that no-till into existing grass? 
It, it was it was uh, Roundup 24D before before uh, no tilling it in. Strict, well, yeah, monoculture, Lespedeza. And in talking with the grower of the seed, who is in Georgia, I can give you the name of the seed company, but I don't have it on the top of my head. But anyway, um, he said, if you want grass mixture, establish straight Lespedeza, and the next year, put in some grass. And again, you know, I'm no-till farmer, so I would no-till some grass in it uh, and then again I'm wrestling with this research project you know and I don't want to put any more variables into the research than I have to but uh, you know it, I, I think I'll try some with uh, with some grass seeding any more discussion about Lespedeza I, I'm really glad to hear that there's some more experience with Lespedeza and maybe we can get together later and share some ideas. Yes? One comment I might have from my experience with it in Arkansas, it, it came in down here about 50 years ago and it didn't last long. Everybody considered it an invader and wanted to get rid of it. But I remember as a, as a kid, my dad and uncle had some. And when they would pay for hay, you probably already know this, if, if they let it dry enough to say to prevent surveillance, it would typically, when you rake it, most of the leaves would end up on that would that would be a, a good thing to try and uh, a little bit of the uh, internet research that I've done is y you can retain the leaves better if you cut it before it starts to shoot buds um, and and the stems are a little more flexible and and that kind of thing. So I'm going to, I'll, I'll, I'll get some more experience with it. And if I'm uh, invited to share this research with the, the grazing lands, uh, next year I'll have more, <laughs> more information. Just, you just out of curiosity, where y'all at? I'm assuming you got mainly cool season perennials um, as far as grasses. Is there any well, that's, that's what our native yeah. plants are. Well, yeah, and, and, and what you're mentioning is that Lespedeza is a warm season perennial. And that, you know, how will that work with a cool season grass perennial? And then, but we also have available to us now some warm season grass that maybe that needs to go into the, the project too. Uh, so I've had, I've had quite a bit of experience with switchgrass, but I don't know, switchgrass will probably mess up everything. <laughs> it's nasty. <laughs> it's nasty. Oh. That stand looks so thick that I don't know whether a grass will ever get up and grow on it. That's a good question. In our 10-year-old uh, paddock, it is not a monoculture. It is very definitely a very diverse, um, and there is plenty of grass in there. And we graze that paddock all year, you know, almost all year because there's something there all the time with the, with the Lespedeza, so. Yeah, I think it's because you're grazing it that the grasses are there. Yeah. Because if you weren't grazing it, the Sericea would be so competitive. Mm -hmm. um, it it, it will be interesting to find out. Yeah. Because one of the com competitions with the Sericea mm -hmm. is cheat. And, and uh, I, I have to manage to get the cheat either harvested or uh, grazed uh, before, the, before the animals won't eat the cheat, you know, the, but so um, we try to, get, try to get the cheat either taken off or, or grazed. So it's, it's just a lot of stuff here to, to think about. So uh, the next topic is sun hemp, and sun hemp is an annual. Anyone experienced with sun hemp? Oh yeah, okay. Um, sun hemp is a legume. And as Judith has said, we really need high protein feed for our animals. 
And so we have, uh, we have seeded every year some, some uh, sun hemp. And I think it's an, an amazing plant too uh, because it'll get that tall. It is, it is a jungle plant and it will grow like mad. I mean, you can watch it grow. Um, it's been really effective with the goats because they are, they're crazy about it. And they can even, we don't let it get that high. We usually graze it at about three or four feet, but they come in, they will bend it down with their toes. They love the flowers more than anything. If it gets that tall and flowers, then they'll bend it down. And, but they will not waste a molecule of this. They'll bend it down, eat the flowers, but then they'll strip all the leaves off the rest of it. And of course, the wonderful thing about this, for those of you who are ruminant, small ruminant producers, how are you gonna get a parasite with a hairy st a stemmed plant that's growing this tall. They're not touching the ground in between. They are selectively eating that stuff. Now there's a, a rumor about that says also about sun hemp that you will get a higher percentage of twinning out of your goats for two years after grazing it. And I think we did experience that with the year when we had the best sun hemp stand that we've had. But I have had, I've had some problems with sun hemp. It doesn't do well in a dry year. You know, it, it's Needs not very drought resistant. Jungle, jungle plant. And nitrogen fixer. Yeah, nitrogen fixer, absolutely. Yes, it is a nitrogen fixer, it's a legume. And so we, we plant it with a inoculant, with a rhizobia. And we don't, see, we just do not get the wastage in the pasture that you see with the, the cattle tromping it down with the goats. And how much, it's pretty high protein. It's like 26, 29, well, sometimes uh, higher. The leaves are high protein. Yeah, the leaves are really high protein. And uh, any more discussion about sun hemp? It's, it's fun to see because it grows so rapidly, you know. I'm not hearing that. Nematoids. Yeah, nematodes. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. Now, can you graze these? Rather than let them get so tall, can you let them take a grazing off and then come back? Yes. <clears throat> yep. As long as it doesn't, as long as it doesn't go to flower, it'll come back. We'll graze it. We've grazed it two and three times in the summer, but it obvious the first frost is completely done. I mean, it, it wilts like, you know, like lettuce. How early did you plant it? Well, you have to have warm soil. So, uh, uh, corn planting time. Corn planting time is what I would say for any of these warm season uh, plants. So, same thing for Lespedeza. Lespedeza is one of the last things to uh, germinate or, uh, you know, grow in the spring. And so, uh, that same thing, it needs warm soil when you establish it. Yes. On your sun hemp, have you had any problems with it moving in the areas you didn't want it to move into? No. Well, it moves, but again, the goats I keep it under control. I think it only moves by seed. Well, it probably. Right. I don't think the state of Arkansas plant board will even let us bring it into the state. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah. I, I know when I talked with some of the seed producers in the Midwest, <laughs> And I talked about Lespedes and some other things. They said, oh, no, it's against the law. It's against the law. We can't sell that kind of seed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, right, invasive. Well, while, while well, this stuff, yeah. I don't, I don't see it move. We've got, we've got I mean, a, a plant or two. I mean, we have probably 100-foot-wide rotational paddocks you know, 16 paddocks and lots, I mean, and we probably move them every five to seven days. And so they chomp it down. Now we don't grow ours that big, so we don't have much seed. We try, try to raise ours when it's four to six feet high because the stalks get this big around, it's like a forest. Um, so uh, we don't have as much of the problem with the seeding. It does travel, I mean, it, in terms of it, it reaches out and it spreads and gets to be very dense. I think you'd probably use it to control weeds, just like corn, because it gets really dense. It, 
it, toxicity with sun hemp. With, with well, cup like plant, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. They're very close, both related. Uh, one thing about the seeds, uh, back to your question, uh, I'm a hard okay, sure. so uh, about what you said about the seeds, uh, there's some there's, there has been some challenges on finding the seeds that were produced here in the US, and a lot of the seeds were coming from South America and in India. In the US. So uh, for some states, there were some restrictions as far as sun hemp goes I mean once it's killed by the frost and such like that and the fact that it does not deal well if we get a little bit of warmth in the spring I'm sure if anything's come up when we we absolutely treat it as a complete annual it does not persist at all I couldn't find a sun hemp plant you know, two years after we planted some in a pasture, anywhere. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a, it, we, we consider it strictly an annual. We've got to plant it, it doesn't go anywhere. Well now, we can really talk about invasives, and that is cup plant. Um, but I am really, really enthusiastic about cup plant. Um, first of all, it is, very high in protein and it has tremendous growth and it is a perennial and it is a native uh, and when Calvin Ernst who developed the, the, the commercial seed said that he was on a farm and the cows got out and the cows walked past corn in order to get to the uh, stream bank and eat cup plant so we've had this now for 15 years and, um, and, and I've had the f forage tests on it, and it, it's just routinely 26% protein. And so with it able to grow that much in a year, it, it produces an, a lot of feed. And I, I've, saw, I've seen research, and there's quite a bit of research in Russia, that it, it, it is yielding on a dry matter basis equal to corn silage. Uh, and it's a perennial and it's high protein. So uh, it gets its name because the leaves form a cup and uh, that can benefit birds and butterflies and pollinators and, and that kind of stuff. Um, we've had it, we've had it uh, for more than 10 years and uh, it, it is just robust. It, 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 it survives the winter, it survives drought, it survives wet feet. It can be wet for 10, I mean, it can be flooded for 10 days and survive. That's one of its claims to fame. What's your grazing management on that? Well, we like to get it when, get them in it when it's no more than three, 30 inches, three feet tall. But they have learned how to push it down and, and eat the, the leaves. Uh, and and they, they like to uh, eat the tops. They'll, they'll push it over enough that they'll eat the tops off. And I can, uh, I can get three, maybe four, but always three grazings with about 30 days between each grazing. And how long is your grazing about? Uh, they'll be in it about a month. Okay. So they're grazing it for about a month and then it's resting for about a month. That's right. And even if they eat it right down and bend it over and stuff like that, you get massive growth from the, from the base. Uh, in that next time. And the thing, one of the things about cup plants that's really good, it's really good at bringing up nutrients from way deep down in the soil. I mean, feet down in the soil. So if you've got poor land and you need to do some self-improvement, it can do that. Yes? Yeah, I'm going to tell you the time is out. We've got, we're going into a 30-minute break for the trade show. If y'all want to continue this discussion, the room's over 30 minutes, you can just keep going. Okay. But uh, You're not I'll, allowed. I'll, I'll, you don't have to. I'll to try to. I'll try to wrap to this it. up. And uh, yep. okay. I, I put this slide in because that's the forage analysis and it's 26% protein. Uh, there's a, a map of where it is native. Uh, you'll find it native uh, a lot of times along the rivers and streams. Um, and uh, it, um, you know, it, it survives the winter. I know, I yeah. saw that. That's wild, isn't it? Just, 
Yeah. yeah. That's so strange. Yeah, why? Do, just why, why it's not good. there. <laughs> not native to here. Uh, I'll get into a, a whole seating thing of it, and it's mm -hmm. unique. And I think anything that's this unique is fun. Um, so it grows very early in the spring. Uh, but when uh, in the fall, it can stand a frost, but it cannot stand a freeze. Um, it's the first thing, first thing that we graze. Before we even have, uh, if you look at the background in some of these pictures, the grass paddocks behind in the back aren't, aren't, aren't but that tall. But the, um, but the cup plant is, is ready to graze. Uh, and so our, our animals need high protein because growing uh, an inch a hair a month and, and being shorn twice a year, they need uh, a lot of protein for that hair. But you can graze cows on that. It, I don't know that. I don't know if you'd have to add some dry, poor hay or, or straw or something. How's that? No, well, it made uh, itself one for a couple of years, but yeah, there's a lot of weed in there, and they chomp down on the weeds they, uh, that are there. But they it, it, it is so, so dense that nothing else grows. Um, there's a few sprigs. When I planted it, I had a little bit of uh, hairy vetch with it. And now and then I can see a stalk of hairy vetch, but that's the only thing. We, we have, I mean, we are definitely a diverse pasture. We don't, we don't spray or do anything like that with it. It just grows and does its thing. And, and the pasture diversifies as things so, mature. You know, uh, goats are browsers rather than grazers, and so they prefer to reach up to get something to eat. And that keeps them away from But here, I like to show this picture. They have a natural way of doing a grazing front. And <coughs> this picture really uh, shows that. In other words, they, they've cleaned all the leaves off and all the tops off, and then they'll work into the next section and a natural grazing front. And uh, OK, so in getting it seeded, it's the first time I ever heard of dormant seeding. And I, uh, Calvin Ernst provided some seed, and I think he gave it to me in February. And he said, you get that planted in February because it has to be stratified. And I didn't get much of a stand at all that first effort, that first year. But then the next year, he said, plant it after Thanksgiving. And I planted it in December, and I got a really good stand. So uh, <laughs> that's dormant seeding. And, uh, and it never sprouted until spring. But it needed to be uh, out there in the cold soil uh, through the winter in order to, to stratify and make the seeds grow. Um, but like we've just discussed, it's very dense. So it's crowding out all the weeds. It's crowd, crowding out what little bit of grass. Uh, we have in our area, uh, orchard grass is just native. Or orchard grass is invasive. Orchard grass comes into all the alfalfa fields. Orchard grass is everywhere. And so um, you know, don't see, it, 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 it outdoes orchard grass. And I never fertilized it. And I asked Calvin Ernst, now anything that produces this much protein, it needs nitrogen. Where's it getting its nitrogen? He says, I don't know. I don't know where it's getting its nitrogen. It's not a legume. And uh, so somehow or another, I, I do keep the, the land limed. And so I mentioned Calvin Ernst, and, and uh, that's where you get the seed. And the seed is expensive, but it only takes two pounds per acre. And uh, I couldn't trust my no-till grain drill to get down to two pounds, so I mixed it with oats. And I... Uh, it's a light seed. It's, a, it's almost a, a, the diameter of a pencil eraser, but flat. And that's about all I have. I'm sorry to keep you late. Any questions? Huh?